I would like to, to, to start with uh, a little bit from uh, uh, what you said, uh, uh, Juliet, about uh, NATO and terrorism and the role of the states, rather. I mean, look at us. We, we, are, a, we are a prime target uh, for, for terrorists. Uh, some VIPs, uh, many diplomats and so on in the middle of a city where there was a terrorist attack on 24 May last year. Uh, the only thing that uh, makes me feel safe is uh, the fact that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Belgium <laughs> is, is very close and it's very well uh, guarded. But um, indeed, I mean, uh, uh, the place of NATO uh, is, is, is a very interesting topic. Uh, uh, it, it was said uh, before, it has, NATO has a lot of capacity, but being in the forefront, that's an incitement also for, for uh, terrorists uh, to, to a certain extent, uh, um, as, as I see it. Fabrizio spoke about uh, uh, the, citizen, the citizens uh, being uh, also a factor of, uh, uh, he said, I think, uh, citizen culture about security uh, issues. I don't know um, how much I represent this, but in any case, uh, as a, as a journalist and, I city, uh, and, and as a citizen, I have the feeling that, uh, to a certain extent, uh, NATO is like the red uh, color to a bull uh, when it comes to uh, uh, terrorism. Uh, uh, I, I would like to, uh, to ask perhaps the first question. Uh, given the current state of relations with, uh, with Russia, uh, and the question goes uh, to Juliet and to Peter in the first place, uh, is it detrimental uh, to the efforts to counter terrorism? Because uh, we imagine that we need to have big players on board. I, I don't know how much uh, Russia today is on board. Uh, maybe not as it was before uh, um, it annexed uh, Crimea. But uh, yeah, that, that's my first question to you. Uh, how is the state of, of play with, uh, with Russia and has this uh, current tensions being detrimental, perhaps, uh, uh, to, to the international efforts overall. I'm happy to make a first comment. Um, as you know, the NATO Russia Council uh, exists now as a channel for communication, but meetings of the NATO Russia um, working groups are no longer taking place. And one of those working groups used to be the uh, group to, on counterterrorism, the ad hoc uh, working group on counterterrorism. And is it a shame that it's no longer functioning? Well, yes, I think it probably is a shame that it's no longer functioning. But is it critical? That's a hard one to answer because there are other international fora where the Russia is present and active. And um, if it is a question of exchanging uh, information, intelligence, best practice, that can take place very easily in other fora. Um, for instance, on the civilian aspect of um, countering terrorism, the Global Counterterrorism Forum is a particularly uh, cutting-edge organization, and Russia can and does attend meetings in that forum and contributes as well through the United Nations and through the OSCE, of course. So, yes, Russia does have things to contribute in the counterterrorism picture, and it, and it is suffering from the, the situation in uh, Iraq and Syria. Um, but the relationship between NATO and Russia is not the issue that's going to stop that, um, the, the interaction between Russia and the other states. Mm -hmm. Peter Spohr, would you like to add something? I heartedly agree with uh, Juliet that it's a big problem for Russia, the foreign fighter phenomenon. Uh, the numbers going uh, from the North Caucasus, from former Soviet republics, now independent countries in Central Asia as well, uh, the, the, the boomerang effect must cause, will I'm sure be causing big concern in Moscow. This is a problem shared. This is not uh, unique to um, the part of the world we're sitting in now. Um, I think though Russia also, we, 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 we talked a bit about the fundamental drivers. I was very interested in your figures from Jordan and the, um, the sectarian uh, drivers. For, for what we're seeing, that the root causes of this conflict. Um, and Russia there has consistently uh, 
I think, played an obstructing role in trying to engineer a political solution to the problem in Syria from the start. That We've had divisions in the UN Security Council as a result. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm being optimistic here, but I would hope if uh, not, nothing else, this foreign fighter phenomenon might um, somehow act as an incentive for Russia to, to, to be a bit more constructive on, on Syria, on the fundamentals. Thank you. Uh, now I give the floor to, to the audience for Q&A. Uh, please, uh, uh, no matter how important uh, and famous you are, uh, indicate, uh, uh, say your name and uh, uh, to whom uh, are you addressing uh, your question. And if, if you are uh, just uh, making a statement, say so that uh, we would not ask the audience uh, to pretend to reply to a question which has not been asked, uh, but uh, you, you have the floor. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Magdalena Kirchner. I'm from the German Atlantic Council. Um, and I have a question to our Jordanian colleagues. Uh, colleague. I really liked uh, the stats and the point that you're raising. I mean, before the, po the pilot was killed, the hashtag, this is not our war, was very prominent in Jordan. And the support for the anti IS alliance is pretty low, and there are a lot of uh, fighters. So when we talk about how to, count, to, to counter the narrative of ISIS among the foreign fighters, we mostly talk about how to counter this in our countries, like in Germany and, and Western Europe. So can you say something about um, the approaches or the efforts that has been done to decrease Arab foreign fighters go, that go into Syria and, and Iraq, and maybe especially in the Jordanian case? Thank you. You have a thought. Um, uh, thank you. Um, let me just uh, make a quick point on the um, hashtag not our war. Uh, when, when it started, um, our pilot wasn't abducted, wasn't um, uh, down, but uh, we measured that in Jordan and uh, we found that nearly um, two-thirds of Jordanians uh, agreed to the statement that it is our war. Uh, and also, uh, more agreed to the statement that this war is a preventive step to protect Jordan. After the killing of our pilot, these figures gone up tremendously. Then, uh, in our tracking polls, uh, the numbers declined a little bit, but not in a significant way that would change how public opinion in Jordan perceives our involvement in the war in Syria uh, on ISIS. Uh, one thing is that overwhelming majority of Jordanians do support the coalition. And again, around two thirds do support Jordanian uh, participation in the strikes. But what is not supported by majority is either special operations or ground uh, troops. Um, I think there is a justification for that because when people look around, it's uh, flames everywhere and they would rather um, keep uh, a position that is not um, um, excited about going into another war in, in the region. Um, to your point on uh, drivers, why people go, and that's again to also uh, the point that Jared made. I think there is a fundamental uh, shift in the way uh, people, in the profile of people who have been involved, participating actively in terrorist organizations or turning themselves into terrorists. 20 years ago, if you look at the literature, everyone was talking about the, um, uh, the root causes. Poverty, unemployment, uh, political repression, uh, corruption. Um, and they were a protest movement or a protest action against an established order. More recent research suggests that actually there is, when the target is a US target, or a Western target in general, the fundamental explanation that is more important than any other explanation is dissatisfaction with the policy 
and people find it as a motivating factor in participating in these things, the Palestine issue, the Iraq war, and the, the, the rest of it. But I think also there is the change that is taking place is turning away from those so-called root causes, the classical explanations, to today you would find the, uh, from the region, uh, there's a difference between people joining from the region and people joining from Western Europe or, or the United States or other countries. For example, the idea that people join Daesh because of lack of freedoms, and you've got open sources reporting the highest number of European fighters coming from Belgium, the country where we are now. Now, is there a lack of freedom in Belgium or lack of economic opportunity? No, there is an economic opportunity, there is a um, good uh, welfare system, and there is freedom. And there... So that, in a way, it does not hold. That explanation does not hold, doesn't explain why this number of people goes to Syria and, and, and fight. From the region, I think also the profile has changed. You've got people with um, higher education. Uh, the most recent example of which a Jordanian medical student in Cairo um, who belonged to a very prominent uh, family, very well-to-do. His father retired major general from the army, current MP in parliament. And he left all this and went to, to Syria. He was killed there. Now that is a upper middle class, if you wish. And that is a resemblance of so many other uh, people who went there. They happen to come from urban areas with a degree, university degree, coming from a family that would spend more than average on monthly expenditure. So the, 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 the profile is, is changing. My last point on this, there is, I think, the idea which came up uh, by um, a Jordanian uh, comic book writer, uh, Suleiman al bakhid uh, who is doing this work, has been doing this work since 2006, before this started all. And he calls it the uh, hero factor, from zero to hero, from insignificant individual in, with, a, with, a, uh, be, with a degree in engineering or, or medicine or whatever, uh, to a very influential figure who controls guns, resources, people, and also decides on their lives in Syria. So that, I think, uh, partly explains why some people go and, and join from zero, from insignificance, to being a very important person. I hope I answered the question.